Good morning. Welcome to the First Church in Oberlin United Church of Christ. It is wonderful to see you this morning, to have you with us, whether you are here in the meeting house or tuning in from home. I can't think of a better way to start a worship service than what we just experienced. Amen. Amen. So just to add on that, I hope you were breathing deeply and richly throughout that. Take a moment just to put your feet on the ground, sit up straight, relax your shoulders, and continue to breathe this morning. Pay attention as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Focusing on something your body does continuously throughout the day and the night without a thought from you. But in this moment, focusing on what your body is doing. Breathing in God's spirit, releasing anything that is racing through your head. You can just note it and say, Yes, I will get to the IGA later. I don't need to think about that right now. And as you're breathing, be conscious of gathering yourself in God's presence, not alone, but with others. As we come together as one people before God's mystery and majesty. Good morning. The story of Jesus includes many moments around tables, as this was part of his ritual of a relationship, even to the last. In this fifth week of the Lent season, we will hear a story of love and devotion from the disciple Mary, directed at Jesus at the table. As we will see, Jesus tries to prepare his beloved companions for his death. Talk of death is like a gut punch to many of us. We would rather believe we and our loved ones are invincible, are able to will ourselves into being strong. We all know that isn't always how the story goes. We are fragile. Our lives, like the plants in the gardens we tend, are susceptible, susceptible to elemental dangers and a life cycle of letting go in order to live. Let us pray together. Holy Lover of souls, we call out to you. You know our tears and sorrows, and you bear the seeds of grief with us. Open us this day to your comfort that nurtures these seeds into sheaves of joy, the simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. So I hid a plant this week because I didn't want anyone to make it pretty. 
brought it out this morning. Now, Mrs. Richards, Prue told me that I was not to turn my back on this one because if you turn your back on it, if you leave it alone for a second, it starts to go yellow. Um, let's see. There's a dead leaf right here. There's a couple of yellow ones over here. There's another one starting to go over here. It's not at its happiest. And I knew if I left it here, somebody would clean it up. <laughs> somebody would take off all the dead things and fix it and make it ready for its little Instagram moment. <laughs> but I left it this way on purpose because although we'd like to make this thing perfect, plants wilt. Sometimes they even die, especially if they belong to me. <laughs> Animals die. People die. And, okay, spoiler alert, Jesus dies. Gonna happen in about a week and a half. I, I hate to break it to you, but it's gonna happen. And it's because we're finite. We're not meant for forever, or at least these bodies, these leaves, are not meant for forever. And somehow, in our story today, Mary, who's a friend of Jesus, gets some idea about what's up. And so she takes this pound of perfume. A pound. That is a lot of perfume, for those of you who do not wear perfume regularly. That's a lot. You're going to smell for days, weeks. And she anoints Jesus' feet with it, and then wipes his feet with her hair. And the disciples are a little shocked by this. And Jesus tells them, well, it's because I'm going to die. Now, we do not like to talk about death, right? We do not like to talk about the fact that everything's finite. And Judas who's in the room and is in charge of saving stuff, is not happy about it. But from what I know, Jesus was never really a saver. Jesus was the sort of person who spends out, spends time, spends his love on others. And that's what Mary does today. As someone who was at a memorial service yesterday, let me tell you, don't save up your love for that rainy day. The rainy day, the snowy day, is today. Make sure if there's someone in your life that you love, tell them today. Tell them now. Don't wait, because we're finite. We're not going to last forever. But love does. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we forget sometimes that things don't last forever. When people talk about the fact that they might not always be around, we don't want to hear it. Help us to react differently to that moment. Help us to take that moment to say I love you and to spend our love extravagantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>I invite you to rise in body and or spirit as we join together in our opening hymn number 206, A Woman Came Who you Did Not Count it. the Cost.
Jesus speaks the words no one wanted to admit. He was not always going to be around. Oh, don't say that. So many of us have said to a loved one who speaks the truth about the fragility of life. Perhaps we get uncomfortable because it reveals the precious nature of the present moment, <laughs> laying bare the beauty and horror of it all, the indescribable pain we know we will one day face invades our senses like a pervasive perfume, inescapable. What if we stopped denying the limited nature of our lives and breathed in deeply the fragrance of vulnerability? Let us take a moment of silent reflection. Hear now this compassionate word from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Know that already God is offering us freedom from the need to avoid suffering at the cost of denying the fullness of life. We are invited into the knowledge that Christ's vulnerability in life, death, and resurrection shows us the sacred nature of the heights and depths of sorrow and joy in our own saga. And now that despite our sometimes faltering steps, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
A reading from John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money not given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in a spirit of prayer. Merciful God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So after hopping around in Luke for a few weeks, this morning we take a leap into a whole other gospel, the gospel of John. We hear a story that might sound vaguely familiar, and yet something is a little off, and that's not surprising. Um, since John is clearly aware of a variety of tra traditions surrounding Jesus and is once again carefully selecting and shaping the story to tell us something important. If you were to line up the four Gospels side by side and look at how each tells the story of a woman anointing Jesus, you would discover that Three Gospels set this in the village of Bethany in Judea, while Luke sets it in Galilee. And three Gospels, the woman goes unnamed, while in John she is Mary, sister of Martha and Lazarus. In another, Martha and Mary host a meal, and Martha serves while Mary sits at Jesus' feet. In one tradition, Jesus' feet get anointed, and in another, his head. John seems to have taken bits and pieces of each and folded them into a unique story, which should alert us to pay particular attention. Often when this story is examined more closely, two aspects tend to get the most attention. The anointing of Jesus with costly perfume that foreshadows a subsequent anointing at his burial. Jen did a nice job of hitting that one this morning. Mary's act of extravagance is thus seen as pointing towards Jesus' death. Malcolm Geit, in his poem, The Anointing and Bethany, captures this spirit. Come close with Mary, Martha, Lazarus, so close the candles stir with their soft breath, and kindle heart and soul to flame within us, lit by these mysteries of life and death. For beauty now begins the final movement in quietness 
an intimate encounter. The alabaster jar of precious ointment is broken open for the world's true lover. The whole room richly fills to feast the senses with all the yearning such a fragrance brings. The heart is mourning, but the spirit dances here at the very center of all things, here at the meeting place of love and loss. We all foresee and see beyond The other focal point is Jesus' critical remark, or Judas's critical remark about the cost of the perfume. As Gabe just mentioned, 300 denarii, nearly a year's wages for a laborer. Just think of how that could have been used to feed the poor. I'll have to admit that I felt a bit like Judas during the renovation project with all the money we put into repairing the front steps of the meeting house. <laughs> It was, I will readily admit, a necessary expense, but there were times when I felt like I was borrowing Judas's calculator. <laughs> this morning, however, I want to draw our attention to another detail in this story. The word dinner. <laughs> this particular word is only elsewhere used in John in specific reference to the Last Supper. And what goes on around that meal in John's version? Another washing of feet. Perhaps John wants us to see Mary prefiguring this event as well. Interestingly, Judas is also present for this ritual. Despite his comments at the dinner with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, a recently resuscitated Lazarus, Judas is still around later at the foot washing, presumably getting his feet bathed by Jesus like all the other disciples. It's only at the dinner that follows that ritual that Judas departs. Now, I think we've often heard that washing feet was a, a standard custom in the times of Jesus by host or hostess. But when we've tried to do foot washing here at First Church, um, that is not something we're accustomed to. <laughs> Even your pastor struggles with it. I remember several years ago, we really made a point of it. And we had, as some of you may recall, all these basins lined up in front of this front pew with rolls of towels that Barbara Rollins had graciously taken out of her somehow unending towel supply <laughs> at her house. And they were stacked up here. And we asked folks to come forward and just find a partner to wash each other's feet. And I'll have to admit, there was part of me that said, no one's going to be bold enough to ask me, so I'll get out of this. <laughs> and that's not what happened. One of our uh, then UCC national staff members, who was frequenting First Church, immediately walked up and asked me. And that's a really intimate moment when you're washing someone's feet, or even washing their hands. How often do we touch one another in that manner, particularly post-COVID, when we haven't been able to touch much at all, but even pre-COVID. So think about that intimate moment between Jesus and Judas. Perhaps John is drawing our attention from one foot washing, one anointing, to another. What is it that John wants us to see in this intimate anointing at Bethany? Perhaps it's simply a different calculus. It's a perspective that steps out of the zero-sum game that tip that's typical of economic calculations. The more that goes over here, the less that can go over there. And directs our eyes to what being in the moment in a deeply loving relationship is all about. And I think it is no accident that a woman beautifully illustrates the point. Mary has been paying attention from her time spent sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to his teaching. 
when it comes to God, nothing is spared when it comes to love. And we are asked to do likewise. That includes both giving as well as receiving. And for some of us, the latter is more challenging. As one scholar notes, Jesus himself accepts and appreciates Mary's right of care and compassion. It is a ritual act that steps out of the world's economy and into God's realm. And I, for one, find that very hard to do at times these days. As we emerge from two years of COVID isolation and disruption, I find myself far too easily tempted to start planning ahead and imagining what things could soon become rather than remaining grounded in the moment, mindful that each and every moment has its blessing to unfold if I can but sit, look, and listen. On my last day of being 59, rather than sitting around in uh, ashes, <laughs> I chose to get back into swimming after being out of the pool for several months. I went over to the pool and it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I started swimming for exercise when I turned 50. And when I first started, I could only swing, swim across the pool one time and then I'd have to take a break. And that went on for weeks. And after being out of the pool for months, I just jumped in and swam and swam. It was great. And so I started figuring out in my head how I could make this a regular routine. And I mapped that out in my calendar. This is how I'm going to make swimming happen three days a week in my life. And then I ran into the schedule at the pool. And I hear I'm not faulting anybody at the pool. I really am. Anybody, don't take that away from this message. There's a shortage of lifeguards. So the pool struggles to meet everybody's needs. And that means some days the pool has to close earlier than other days. So I showed up on Friday to go swimming, and I found every lane double booked. And I just walked away and went back home. It was an unpleasant reminder of how hard it is to plan in the midst of COVID and coming out of COVID. It requires a complete reorientation to thinking, well, you know what? Every day I'm going to try and swim, and if I manage to pull it off three days in a week, it's a good week. <laughs> Reflecting on this, our passage this morning, New Testament scholar Gail R. O'Day notes, what Jesus will do for his disciples and will ask them to do for one another, Mary has already done for him in this story. In Mary, then the reader is given a picture of the fullness of the life of discipleship. Her act shows forth the love that will be the hallmark of discipleship in John and the recognition of Jesus' identity that is the decisive mark of Christian life. The power of the witness of Mary's discipleship in this story is that she knows how to respond to Jesus without being told. She fulfills Jesus' love commandment before he even teaches it. As many of us have often, sung, have often sung, they will know we are Christians by our love. Discipleship is lived out in loving service to others. If we take the example of Judas, we end up with a stingy refusal to celebrate life, to mourn, to feel to be in the moment. We will remain enmeshed in a zero-sum economic calculus that is grounded in an ideology of scarcity instead of a th theology of abundance. We will be forever planning and chasing the next thing, the next expenditure, the next worthy cause, the next relationship, rather than fully participating in God's gift of each day. The poem and anthem Christus Paradox refers to Jesus the Christ as the 
everlasting instant. A paradox to be sure, but one at the heart of our faith. UCC pastor and author Rachel Hackenberg asks, do we know how to serve one meal at a time like Martha? To listen to one teacher at a time like Lazarus? To love one dying man at a time like Mary? For the sake of love, I pray we do. A bit later this morning, we will celebrate communion, a ritual act that calls us into a moment fully present with Christ and one another. May we, in all of our moments, be like Mary, extravagant in sharing our love with others in the moment, not holding back, but risking everything, even the pain of death, in order to fully participate in the everlasting instance of each day. In doing so, may we perfume the world around us in ways that make for lasting change. In closing, a few words from John Henry Newman's poem, Radiant Christ. Dear Jesus, Help us to spread your fragrance everywhere we go. Flood our souls with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess our whole being so utterly that our lives may only be a radiance of yours. Shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel your presence in our souls. Amen. We come now to a time of prayer, and we begin with sharing joys and concerns with one another. This morning, you have three ways you can do that. You can fill out the back of the insight cover of your bulletin with either prayer requests and or announcements, and tear that out and hand it to an usher. They will collect them and bring them to me. If you have a Facebook account and you know how to add stuff into the chat, you can add your prayers into the Facebook chat of the live stream. And whether you're here in the meeting house or at home, you can also make use of your favorite electronic device to send an email to prayers at firstchurchoberlin, all spelled out, dot O-R-G. Let us take a moment to share our joys and concerns with one another. <laughs>
as we continue in our prayers together. Let us remember Joanne Nuremberg and her family at the passing of her husband, Don. Prayers for the people in Ukraine, not knowing what awaits around the corner. Prayers for the manatees who are dying from starvation because of pollution killing their food supply. Prayers of thankfulness for the sprouting of some peace for people in Yemen and courage for needed re uh, rebuilding. Prayers of joy and forgiveness. Prayers for all the immigrants worldwide. Prayers for the life of John Corbett's. Never was there a better man. Prayers of gratitude for all the prayers and support I've received from the congregation this last week. Prayers for healing for Tim and strength for Julie and Marion. Prayers for Stevie. Prayers for the families broken apart by war and circumstance. Prayers for a legal procedure this week involving family conflict and child custody. Prayers for all who live in extreme poverty and are most vulnerable to the devastating, devastating impact of climate change. Help us to protect our neighbors around the world from this crisis. Prayers for the student body of Oberlin as they continue to navigate the course of the ongoing, of ongoing midterms and pandemic. I would add to that prayers for all students, faculty, and staff as they enter into what I imagine is a much needed spring break this week. And also, uh, you may have seen where the appeal decision came down at the tail end of the week involving the lawsuit between Gibson's Bakery and Oberlin College. I'm not going to comment on that. You can read about it in the paper. Other to say that I do hope and pray and ask you to pray for the restoration of relationships. What I've said from the start is that our legal process is wholly unequipped to help people with reconciliation can mete out punishment, it can try to restore things, but it can't right relationships. And I've always felt at the heart of this dispute was the relational issue. So prayers for reconciliation of relationship. Let us continue our prayers in silence. Holy and gracious God, we come before you this morning as a thankful people, grateful for the gift of each and every day, of each and every moment, for the fresh winds of your spirit, for the wonders of your creation, for the everlasting instant of your beloved Son. Help us to sit with Mary in our moments throughout the week, to be in the moment, to be extravagant in sharing our love.
to risk setting aside our calculators and embracing your extravagant grace, love, and forgiveness. <clears throat> Grant that we may be your ambassadors in our world, your messengers of peace and reconciliation, restoration, and wholeness. O oh God, we lift up to you this day our concerns for our world, for the many troubled places. For almost a third of our world is involved in some sort of conflict. We pray for refugees and immigrants, for those seeking basic needs, food, clothing, shelter. We also pray for those who do not feel loved, who do not see themselves as loved, that they may receive your message of love as beloved children. We pray for our country as we emerge from COVID and continue to sort out our political differences. Let us not let those differences divide us neighbor from neighbor, family member from family member. But let us overcome those differences in our common humanity and love for one another as our beloved sisters and brothers. We pray for our community. We pray for reconciliation, restoration of relationships. We pray for rest and renewal. And we lift up our prayers for our family and friends those that we know most intimately. We pray for their needs. And we lay before you, O oh God, our own needs, particularly those that we have not dared to share with others, but that are known only to you. We lift all this up in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Some announcements this morning. This is a final reminder that camp registration information needs to be submitted to Jen by tomorrow, April 4th, if you would like First Church to help pay for camp at Temple Hills. More information about camp offerings is on the welcome table in the gallery. The Rotary Club of Oberlin will be offering an all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast Sunday, April 10th, from 8 in the morning until 1 p.m. So yes, you can come to church and still get to the pancake breakfast. <laughs> Otherwise, the Rotary might be getting a call. Uh, $6 per person, kids five and under free. Uh, new location, the Oberlin Elementary School Cafeteria on 210 North Park Street. Proceed, proceeds to support Oberlin Safety Town. Do college students get to go to that? Sorry, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> I suppose all of us need a refresher course on traffic lights and crosswalks. <laughs> Please go to the breakfast. I'm sure it'll be delightful. Also, immediately following worship this morning, grab a cup of coffee and head down to the JFO room where um, William Vanderbilt will be continuing his adult ed program on the Bible, and this morning is the New Testament. Also, uh, 
a big thank you for your ongoing financial support of First Church, for your generous giving, for all that you do that keeps this space open and available. I have a bit of exciting news to announce this morning. Um, some of you may recall in 1970 when the Kent State shootings took place that Oberlin College and Conservatory responded by sending uh, many students, singers, vocal ensembles to Washington, D.C. to stand on the steps of the Washington National Cathedral and sing Mozart's Requiem as their response to that tragic event. At this year's reunion weekend, which is June 4th and 5th, there will be a cluster reunion for the class of 1970, 71, and 72. And they have asked to sing that requiem again in commemoration of that event. And that um, performance will be held here at First Church. So it is your generous giving that makes that possible, that allowed us to redesign this space and make it flexible enough to accommodate this really significant event in the life of this community and beyond. Thank you for your continued support. I invite you to rise in body and our spirit as we join in singing the doxology. Let us pray. Generous God, in light of your extravagant blessings, no matter what the state of the world or our imperfect lives, we offer our gifts and ourselves and know that you transform what we plant into the produce of your love. Amen. Our service continues with the communion liturgy found in your bulletin. Christ looks upon each one with love and says, You are welcome and Christ looks upon each one with compassion and says, Christ looks upon each one with grace and says, Will you come? Will you bring your troubles? Will you shed all that is unnecessary in your life? This is the place where you need not be perfect. You need not be sure of yourself or your faith. You need not feel whole and right with the world. Jesus invited many to his tables, and in doing so, he assured them of their place in the illogical reign of love and grace. He just wanted them to be hungry for relationship, hungry to look across a table into another's eyes, to break open their lives, and lift a cup in the midst of the hard times and hear, this is for all, and so this is for you, beloved. The holy living God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right in a good and joyful thing any time and everywhere to give thanks to you. You created this world full of so much beauty and sorrow and called it good and called it enough. Although we feel lost at times, you are ever present. We doubt, resist, turn away, and rage insistent on our own power to pull us through, and yet sure that we are to blame, making life seem like a confusing paradox. 
but you are patient. You are here to meet us, reside with us in strange and alienating times, always faithful, always present in this body, in this body. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He proclaimed freedom for the bound, justice for the oppressed, grace for the lost, and love for the prodigal. Through the life and ministry of Jesus, we can imagine and live into a community where all who struggle are taken into loving arms and those who struggle to love are invited into greater compassion. You may be seated. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we remember. We offer ourselves. We proclaim God's time. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We remember and proclaim redeeming love. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us sustenance for our days, love for simple and ordinary lives, fuel for justice in this world. By your spirit, open us to each other. Open us to the world, making us one in you through Christ in the power of your amazing grace. And now let us be bold in praying the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All things are now ready. body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. Christ shed for you, take and drink.
Let us join together in the prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. God of all grace, may we live in expectation and hope, and may the gifts we have received at this table remind us not only of the gift of your Christ, but of your steady presence among us, that we may act faithfully in response to your love. Amen. I invite you to rise in body and our spirit as we join together in our closing hymn, number 210, said Judas to Mary. are you, dear one, doing this holy work of suffering what must be suffered, of grieving what has been lost, of knowing the unthinkable truth that must be known? This grief can make you feel on the other side of glass from the world around you, a force field of different realities separating you. Yet blessed are you in yours, for yours is the one most seen by God who breathes compassion upon you even now, who has walked this path and who leans towards you, gathering you up into the arms of love. Rest now, dear one, you are not alone. And now may the God who loves all of creation, especially the grief-stricken parts, and Jesus, our companion along this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit, who loves to improvise in surprising ways, go with you, dwell among you, and give you joy. Amen. <laughs>